Hello, uh, my name is Ethan Zlotowinski and uh, with me is Joanna Wysocka from, the, from Stanford University. Uh, Joanna, you're interested, you study um, epigenetic regulation of embryogenesis uh, with a special interest in the role of, uh, roles of en enhancers yeah. in this process. Uh, so uh, to start with, I thought uh, to ask, um, what are the general characteristics of, um, of the modulation, epigenetic modulation of en enhancers during the early embryogenesis? So, uh, enhancers have some general epi epigenomic features which, uh, which have been discovered uh, over the years at first individual loci and now uh, generalized, uh, which obviously include uh, loss of nucleosomal density, so en enhancers clearly are genetic elements that, that are bound by combination of transcription factors and for transcription factors to access the genome, they have to compete out the nucleosomes. So, chief characteristic, chromatin characteristic of enhancers, is, is nucleo, uh, loss of um, is nucleosomal depletion. Uh, but also, we have certain histone modifications on um, on fl flanking regions that are associated with either poised or active enhancer states, and, and those include, uh, for example, lysine uh, 3K27 acetylation, which is, which is uh, tightly linked to enhancer activation. And having those chromatin signatures really allows us now to map enhancers in a genome-wide and cell type-specific manner by coupling uh, this chromatin understanding uh, with, with technologies like ChIP-seq and uh, hypersensitivity map mapping, etc. So uh, one of the more interesting uh, model systems you work with is uh, neuro, um, NeuroCrest cells. Um, could you please um, explain to us what is the role of uh, NeuroCrest cells in uh, embryogenesis and uh, why you're studying them? So I, I'm not objective here, but I think neural crest cells are the most interesting cell type that there is. And, and these cells are truly fascinating. They, they form early in development in the dorsal part of, of, of the neural tube. And then they delami, delaminate and migrate long distances. They're, they're also sometimes referred to as explorers of the embryo. And a fascinating feature that initially attracted me to these cells is their enormous developmental or epigenetic, if you will, plasticity. So they can differentiate to over 100 different cell types, uh, including uh, neurons in the glia and, and um, the variety of mesenchymal cell types and also pigment cells. And what is really interesting, these cells are ectodermal in origin, they come up from the, out of the neural tube, and yet they are able to make all these uh, mesenchymal derivatives that comprise our head and face. So in fact, most of the head and face structures, uh, bone, cartilage, and connective tissue is from the neural crest, whereas er everywhere else uh, in the body, uh, bone and cartilage is derived from the mesoderm. So very unusual situation. So we thought, well, there has there have to be very interesting regular, regulatory principles go governing uh, that uh, type of behavior, and and that brought us to, to neural crest. Right. So then, um, what you decided to do was to study this uh, you know, with a with an evolutionary view. Um, to see uh, not uh, to study not just human uh, um, neural crest cells, but also compared to chimpanzee neural crest cells, and to see how the di differences from them, especially in regard to uh, enhancer activity and enhancer modulation, epigenetic modulations of enhancers, um, uh, contributed to to craniofacial development. So, what were um, what, what is the main uh, what were the main findings, the major findings you, you found by comparing um, the human and the chimpanzee cells? So, so first I, I should say that again, neural crest cells are, are very interesting from an evolutionary perspective because they are relatively late evolutionary inventions specific to, to vertebrates, and they really have sought to facilitate our evolutionary success. As, um, as vertebrates in colonizing different environments and adapting to different predatory lifestyles. And with respect to human evolution, they're of course a target of, of selective pressure and, and they neural crest drive structure contributed to, to human evolution in multiple ways are responsible not only in, for uniquely human facial appearance, but also adaptations associated with enlarged brain size, speech articulation, upright posture, etc. Uh, so once once um, 
uh, we developed human neural crest uh, in vitro model, and I, I should say that in context of humans and higher primates, neural crest cells are highly inaccessible from in, in, in vivo. These cells form at three to five weeks of gestation, they're transient migratory. Yeah. So our only way really to, to get hold of these cells was to derive them in vitro, taking advantage of, uh, of uh, this revolution with ability to, to, to now derive uh, induced pluripotent stem yeah. cells from variety of species. So once we develop and characterize this, this system for humans, we realized, well, perhaps we can in, extend this approach to, to other non-human primates in, in, in sort of evo devo view of, of, of enhancing landscape evolution. And this is uh, indeed what we've done. We, we mapped, we used epigenomic profiling strategies to map enhancers, both in human and chimpanzee neural crest, in order to identify elements that are both human biased or chimp biased in activity. And uh, it turns out that, that many of the enhancers that, that we're finding uh, are in fact associated with loci that have been implicated in craniofacial development, often uh, actually with dosage specific effects. So in fact, many of the loci at which we, we detect human bias or chin bias enhancers show dosage sensitivity as, as um, implicated by haploid insufficiency in human syndromes or, or, or work in the model organisms. So I think this, this really allowed us to systematically identify enhancer uh, regions that change their regulatory activity during recent human evolution and now we're following up to explore uh, some specific candidates and their impact uh, on neural crystal behavior and, and morphology. So um, this um, variability in the activity of enhancers and their genes uh, between chimpanzees and humans uh, is, is one of the basis for the, for the phenotypic variability between us and other primates and also uh, between different uh, human individuals, uh, I presume. Uh, so, which in this regard, which would, uh, which is the greater uh, variability bet uh, between us and ch chimpanzees and humans, or between different human individuals? Uh, clearly, you know, there, or, there's and also, at least by the way, in be between different chimpanzees, if this was done, I don't know because <laughs> yeah, to yeah, me they yeah. all look the same. But uh. <laughs> no, actually, they don't. And in fact, <laughs> those genetic <laughs> variations and 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 uh, perhaps in, in many respects phenotypic variation it may may be higher in chimps than it is in humans. Oh, We're wow. just so incredibly tuned. We have a whole part of our brain that is tuned to recognizing yeah. faces. So, so we are actually very good at picking up individual variation in facial features, and and indeed we're very interested in pursuing the the uh, intra species or individual variation yes. of, of enhancer functions in, in in the neural crest as well. Uh, clearly, the differences between human chimps are bigger. Uh, also, the genomic variation is about you know ten times. Uh, um, bigger, let's say, between human and chimp, and even between human and, and Neanderthal. Um, yeah. uh, but I think, you know, uh, interestingly, we also have some preliminary data suggesting that the overlapping set of loci may, may, may be uh, involved in both inter and intra species variation uh, of, right. of neural crest regulatory landscapes in, in, in higher primates. Which, uh, which I think it's uh, it's quite interesting. Indeed. So, so taking up taking it up from here, are you interested in um, um, exploring for the other uh, morphogenetic um, uh, developmental uh, programs? Uh, or in other words, is is the prime goal the ultimate goal is to to um, elucidate what makes us human, or at least what makes us look human? <laughs> So, so for now, we, we're really focusing on, 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 on the human face and the neural crest derivatives uh, because uh, already there, uh, the complexity is great and yes. it will take us years to, to, to really decipher it. However, I think that our approach, which I, I refer to in my talk as silver anthropology, meaning uh, using silver models of, from higher primates um, in vitro, pluripotent stem cell based in vitro differentiation models followed by epigenomic mappings to, to study enhanced landscape evolution and, and to study uh, connection between regulatory evolution and phenotypes, I think this will be very generalizable to, to many systems. And now 
uh, while we can't access uh, embryonic tissues from, from higher primates, uh, essentially at all for, 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 for early development, using this in vitro differentiation yes. models, we will be able to, to, we as a field more generally, to look at, at um, uh, regulatory evolution in, in many different uh, systems and, and organs, in, including clearly also brain development and, and neural development. So uh, um, just to wrap it up, uh, my last question is um, uh, very related uh, or somewhat related, is that um, recently you published uh, data that shows that uh, following the um, uh, genome-wide uh, demutilation uh, uh, of uh, in early uh, human embryogenesis, um, <coughs> several um, specific, specific uh, human endogenous uh, retroviruses uh, actually produce proteins and that these proteins uh, have cellular functions. So would you, could you speculate what such proteins or the, retrovi the human retrovices in general can have or had on human evolution and maybe still on, on human uh, phenotypic variability? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, probably the, the most prevalent way by which endogenous retroviruses contribute to human evolution is, is through contributing regulatory sequences like LTR elements. Uh, and, and it's very clear that uh, now from multiple studies that, that L in, from different endogenous retroviruses, different LTRs can be adapted for, for regulatory function, either for alternative promoter function or a long range enhancer function. So while we don't see retroviral reactivation per se, let's say in, in neural crest cells, and we don't see the repression of proteins uh, being produced. On the other hand, we do see uh, a subclass of the LTR elements of endogenous retroviruses being adapted for, for regulatory function. And interestingly, some of our species bias, human bias or chimp bias enhancers are actually derived from LTRs of endogenous retroviruses. So those clearly, you know, we, you can't ignore half of the, of the, of the human genome is, co is composed of, of uh, transposon elements. And most of these transposons invaded human genome during, at some point during primate evolution and in, in fact are not shared yeah, with the right. mouse, even though mouse of course has their own set of transposons. Yeah. So if we really want to understand uh, human specific aspects or primate specific aspects of development, we simply cannot ignore half of the genome no, that, that's exactly. there. <laughs> Well, um, that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was fascinating. Thank you very much.